all for coming to uh, tonight to this program sponsored by the League of Women Voters. My name is Sherry Latash, and along with Ann Yoshida, we're the co-presidents of the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government and works to influence public policy through education and advocacy. It's almost the end of February, signaling the conclusion of Black History Month. Even knowing the background of Black History Month, I admit to a certain unease and discomfort. Black history is American history, and it should be discussed 12 months a year, not limited to the month of February, which, as comedian Chris Rock has noted, is the shortest and coldest <laughs> month of the year. <laughs> not exactly when you want to have a parade. Arguably, we would not be here tonight were it not for Carter G. Woodson, the African-American Harvard-educated historian, scholar, educator, and publisher. In 1926, he created Negro History Week to honor the contributions of African-Americans to American history. He designated February as the month of commemoration as a way to honor the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. With the civil rights movement and a growing awareness of black identity, Negro History Week evolved into Black History Month on many college campuses. In 1976, our bicentennial year, then President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month, calling upon the public to, quote, seize the opportunity to honor the two often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history, unquote. Thanks to WTTW's programming in February and continuing into March, there have been many opportunities to learn about black history and culture. In particular, the documentary From DuSable to Obama, which is viewable online, describes the history of African American life in Chicago from its founding in the 1780s through the election of President Obama. While the history of black Chicago has been documented, what do we know about the life of African Americans who lived on the North Shore? For that, we can thank tonight's speaker. By day, Dino Robinson is the production manager at Northwestern University Press. He's our guest speaker tonight because of his passion and avocation. His independent research in 1995 led to the establishment of the Shorefront Legacy Center in 2002 to further the work in the collection and preservation of histories about black communities in Chicago's northern suburbs. Within Shorefront, Dino has written three books, produced the quarterly Shorefront Journal for 10 years, and its later transition to an online journal, designed and assembled multiple exhibits, lectured in multiple venues, and established a growing archive of more than 170 linear feet of archival material related to local black communities. He is a past board president of the Evanston History Center and a founding board member of the Organization of Black Designers in Chicago, now called Osmosis. Dino holds a degree in advertising design with a minor in African American Studies from Loyola University in Chicago. Prior to his joining Northwestern University Press, he had held creative positions in advertising and operated his own design firm. A resident of Evanston, Dino is the recipient of several awards. In 2017, he was presented with the key to the city of Evanston. <coughs> Other awards include the Distinguished Leadership Award from the Community Leadership Association, the Mayor's Award for the Arts, and the Evanston NAACP Education Award. He has appeared on WTTW's Chicago Tonight, Channel 7, Local Cable Access TV, Chicago Tribune Magazine, the Chicago Reader, and various local North Shore publications. Please join me in welcoming the founder and director of the Shorefront Legacy Center, Dino Robinson. Every time I hear my bio, I still sometimes look around and say, is that really me? <laughs> Did I do all this stuff? Um, again, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, as Sherry um, stated, that um, I am the founder of Shorefront, and 
Um, this, in a way, is like a welcome home for me as well. Um, I grew up part of my life here in Glenview. Um, attended Pleasant Ridge Elementary School and one year at Springman Junior High School during the 1970s. So it was an interesting time. I'll get to that later on. But um, we can start with the presentation. Um, this uh, presentation is entitled North of Chicago. And the reason why uh, this is uh, we sort of working on this is that when the Chicago metro area talks about black history, uh, it's usually focused on Chicago's south side. What is ignored is Chicago west side and the surrounding suburbs. And I just want to say we have an imprint in this region that's always looked over. And even when we argue with uh, grantors uh, like McCormick Foundation and, and others in Chicago where they will fund only within the borders of Chicago, I would always say that, well, without a lot of these Evanston residents and North Shore residents, you can't tell the complete story of Chicago. You can't tell the complete story of the Chicago Defenders, directors, or, or executive editors without mentioning people who were lived from the uh, North Shore or South Shore living in those areas that worked for that paper. So with that argument, I always said, well, let's develop a history here. And it's hard to talk about uh, the black experience in the state of Illinois, uh, realizing that at one point, the territory of Illinois almost became a slave state. The vote difference was between about a 2,000 vote difference. So every vote does count where we decided not to be a slave. However, Illinois did adopt the Ohio Black Codes. And they were just a step above slavery. And I'm going to read some portions of this, of what it entailed, so you have an understanding of what was developing in the state of Illinois at the time. Illinois in 1818 abolished slavery in its constitution. Though the question of slavery appeared on ballots in 1824 and lost by a difference of just over 2,000 votes. Illinois followed the Ohio policy of trying to prevent black immigration by passing laws requiring blacks who have moved into the state to produce legal documents verifying that they were free and post bonds as high as $1,000 to guarantee their good behavior. Anti-immigration legislation was passed in Illinois in 1819, 1829, and 1853 that could be used against whole communities when white citizens found that the increase of the black population had reached an unacceptable level. Blacks who violated the law faced punishments that include being advertised and sold at public auction. Illinois Territory prohibited free blacks to immigrate to the territory and decreed all who did must leave within 15 days after notice or receive 39 lashes. Every person, every person bound to service or indentured into the territory was to continue as such under state government, though children born of such persons were, be to, were to be emancipated, the boys at age 24 and girls at age 18. Any free black person in Illinois without such a certificate would be considered a slave and a runaway and was liable to be arrested, arraigned before justice, advertised in the newspapers for six weeks by the county sheriff. If no owner came forth to claim the black person, that county could still sell them, him or her, as an indentured servant for one year. The black codes further stated, to employ an uncertified Negro was to incur a fine of a dollar and a half for each day he labored. To harbor a slave or servant or hinder his recapture was a felony, punishable by a fine of twice the value of the man and 30 stripes on the bare back. To sell to or buy of or trade with a slave or servant without consent of the master was absolutely forbidden. If a slave was found 10 miles from home without a permit, he was liable to arrest and flogging. Should he appear at any house or farm without written permission from his master, the owner of the place would to which he came might give him ten lashes well laid on. Should he commit any offense for which a white man would be fined, he would be whipped at a rate of twenty lashes for every eight dollars of fine. These Illinois acts stayed on the books until 1865. So not too progressive, is it? <laughs> so that was the state. So when I started researching early African-American settlements in the North Shore, 
Um, I did come across one family with the last name of Malak in 1850, that's recorded in the census, and they're in the Evanston Territory. But within the next census tract, they were no longer there. And after reading this, you can see why. So if the population sort of increasing, if they may be undocumented or run the risk of not having the right documentation, they can be slowed back into slavery. So I have no idea where that family went to or migrated to. And there was another family up in um, Gurney that had did the same thing, where they had sub made a settlement there and then later moved. Despite that, though, there was a growing African-American presence in the North Shore. And many migration patterns came from the South escaping slavery to Canada and then directly back to the North Shore area, Evanston, Glencoe, and Lake Forest. And with Lake Forest, uh, which was kind of unusual, is that it probably was the site of the oldest established black church in 1865. The church stayed in existence until 1920. It's now part of the Lake Forest College campus. If you see on the map there, the pink and green area, that was the uh, center of the black community in Lake Forest. Glencoe, Illinois, also had a growing community. Its population grew from 102 in 1900 to 635 by 1960. However, there was something called the syndicate that was happening in Glencoe, where they were, uh, the community was trying to limit the population of African Americans and Italians, deeming the properties uh, undesirable, so they sent they created new housing restrictions and raised multiple houses to create new parkways. Um, the black community uh, basically kind of stayed around Jefferson Avenue. Uh, there is a church there, St. Paul Amy Church, which still exists today. That was established in the late 1800s. Evanston is the longest uh, settlement or the long-term settlement of the African-American population. Its territory actually went as far south as Devon Avenue, now mostly Rogers Park. But you see in Evanston's community, and this is where we spent a lot of time on because of the most stable community, there was a population currently about 13,000 right now. So there's a lot of living history there, so we're trying to capture as much and document as much as possible. But early Evanston's history had a community of Evanstonians, and it wasn't designated by ethnicity or race. But it wasn't until after 1900 where Evanston started establishing a pattern of segregation that inside of 30 years, what was a diverse community by nature became a highly segregated community that practiced Jim Crow. And the gray area, the, the brown area there is the uh, the uh, historic African-American community, which if you go there today, is pretty much in that same state. Some of the early churches in uh, the North Shore, I already mentioned the one on Lake Forest, it was an AME church, but there was also Ebenezer AME church established in 1882 in Evanston, Second Baptist Church in 1882 also in Evanston, St. Paul AME in Glencoe, and Lake Forest, uh, Mount Zion back in Evanston, and then Lake Forest AME in 1860. Um, and one of my discussions I have with this, I call it the Battle of the Churches, because for a long time at Evanston, Ebenezer and Second Baptist were kind of battling who what church was first, because you see they have the same year. Um, there was a, uh, the first Baptist church, which is now Lake Street Church, and uh, it did accept uh, African-American congregants there, but um, Around 18, 1870, 1880, they requested a letter of dismission to form their own church in good graces. But the group that left uh, were of two faiths, Baptist and Methodist. Each of them met in homes and around areas and, and, and meeting halls as a congregation grew. However, to get designation as a recognized church, you have to be sponsored by the uh, parent church. So in this battle, which I had to battle with the city of uh, with these two churches for multiple years because the handwritten records were not clear, um, the difference was 15 days. <laughs> and I asked questions like, okay, if you see the first church and your oral history states that the black congregants left because they're only allowed to sit in the balconies of First Baptist Church. I find that puzzling because First Baptist Church didn't have a balcony at that time. 
And if you say you left in protest, if you left in protest, why then for 10 years did the black congregants still continue to tie to the church they say they claim they leave in protest? So I just had these questions. And the more questions I had, the more frustrated these church members were becoming. And I said, all I want to do is prove your history. Because let's say the city of Evanston decides to practice eminent domain and that all churches and all nonprofits have to leave the downtown area so they can put for-profit entities there to build up the tax base. And all you have to do is prove your history. If you're going by your oral history that's incorrect, that day by day is becoming more and more provable online, you run the risk of losing your property. So all I want to do is set paperwork to prove your history. And besides that, the real history is much more compelling than the oral history that has been exposed over the, over the decades. And it was much more interesting because it involved four different churches here in Evanston, um, in Evanston and in Chicago. It involved a, a, a pastor at the time that was really vibrant and went on to start off many other churches, not only in Chicago and Evanston, but throughout the northern suburban communities as well. So once I started explaining that really dynamic story, they're like, oh, yeah, this is, this is pretty cool. I said, well, if you want to change your church, because for a long time, Second Baptist was saying that they were the first established church. I said, well, all you have to do is just change one word in there. Because what was left out in some early history is that they said Second Baptist was the first black church. All you have to do is say Second Baptist was the first black Baptist church. There we go. <laughs> little loophole. <laughs> Uh, some early history. In this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about some early pioneers. Um, and I have a little surprise. I have some information about Glenview, too, so I hope that this will be some new information for some. But I have to say, it was extremely hard looking for black presence, early black presence in Glenview. Extremely hard. <laughs> So Andrew Scott was uh, a corporal in the Civil War. Uh, he was stationed in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He unloaded uh, cargo ships um, off the uh, Mississippi. Uh, he uh, was automatically discharged and moved his family to Chicago and then to Evanston, where he built his house in 1870, which still stands today in its most present state, and it is a historic landmark. He was a founding member of Second Baptist Church and a founding member of Mount Zion Baptist Church. And his daughter continued to live in a family homestead house until 1960. So almost for 100 years, that same house stayed in the family. The story has it that the family kept a scrapbook. And I am looking for this scrapbook. Uh, one member of the, um, of the community has seen it um, back in the 60s. And when the family kind of dispersed and moved to different areas in Zion, um, uh, Zion, Illinois, and in Zem, Minnesota, which I found, that's where I found this photograph in Zem, Minnesota. The families there called me and said, well, we heard about the scrapbook. Do you know anything about it? I said, well, I was hoping you know something about it because I'm really looking for the scrapbook because it will chart a number of significant moves that happened in Evanston at that time and can tell a bigger story of the North Shore. Well, my first research project, and again, uh, when I started Shorefront, this was a self-interest. I started this in 1995 as a self-interest, and um, on a challenge by a local newspaper uh, called Evans and Clarion, where we met at a gathering and started talking about our hobbies and what we like doing. He was doing photography and illustrations. I was doing graphic design and doing my own family um, genealogy. And he kind of flipped the switch and said, it would be great if you write an article about black history in Evanston and the North Shore. And I'm just thinking like, hmm, flashback to my college years, English grades, mm, you don't want me writing anything. <laughs> but he kept badgering me for about a month. And the more he badgered me, the more questions I had. And so I started asking questions. And then I ended up going to the Evanston Library and some other libraries in the, locate, in the area, asking about what was the black presence in, 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 in the North Shore. And many entities kept pointing to other entities as well, we don't have anything, go to this entity and you'll find something. Well, eventually I made my way to the Evanston History Center and I asked the same question and they went over to the archive files and probably pulled out three file folders labeled colored. And I said, yeah, something has to be done. <laughs> so I went back to the, uh, the editor and I said, yes, I will write, but I need more than one column to write more than 150 years worth of history. 
So he gave me a series, and I wrote about 14 articles throughout his newspaper, and then, then he folded it after that. But one of my research projects that I was sort of working on was uh, Josephine Taylor. And for the longest time, all I saw advertised about her was Madam H.M. Taylor. And I'm just thinking, like, she has a first name. So let me try and find this first name. And it took me a while, but what I found in the end was something dynamic. She's originally from Kentucky. Uh, she moved to Chicago, which is a chambermaid in uh, different hotels in Chicago. And then she moved to Evanston and worked with her husband with her upholstery business they opened in downtown Evanston. And then she later branched off and started a catering business and had three locations in Evanston. She made most, so, much, so much money that she uh, payrolled the first pastor at Ebenezer Amy Church. She was well known. So that was like my best research. Like one, I got her first name. <laughs> Two, here is an entrepreneur that did things, which also led me to this other question that always came up. Uh, why did the black community choose the North Shore to live? Is it because it's just domestic services that they can find those jobs? And I thought about that for a while, and I said, you know, the families that came here were not domestics and servants. They were entrepreneurs. Now, at the time, the jobs that were available to people of color were of a service capacity. But these same people started businesses on their own, built churches, established clubs and organizations, and maintained their own community. I think that's a pioneer. That's an entrepreneur. That's someone that starts something. And Josephine Taylor embodied that at that time period. William Toos was another local resident that I had a lot of fun doing some research on. Uh, from Davenport, Iowa, he came to Evanston to attend Garrett Biblical. His first job was that of a barber. Then he opened up his own barber shop. And then he opened up his own printing business and became Evanston's first African American printer. Uh, he worked with the pastor of Ebenezer Amy Church and they established the Afro American budget. There are three copies that I've seen, and they're housed at the Northwestern University Special Collections. And when I went there to look at them, I kind of went there with my, my cotton gloves, you know, archival process, got my camera, I'm taking pictures of pages. I said, this could be really interesting. And when I went there to ask for it, they said, sure, here there it is. I'm like, okay. I said, yeah, if you want to make copies, the copy machine's over there. Okay. <laughs> So, I mean, this was a budget size, a, a, a six by nine type of publication. For a long time in the history, people just called it a newspaper, which was like just the wrong description. So, when I was first looking for this, I was looking for a newspaper. I did not realize it was a six by nine publication. Um, it was dense with information. One of the topics that William Twiggs wrote was, should the Afro-American population relocate to Haiti mm -hmm. as an independent country? Uh, the, uh, uh, a female writer wrote, what is the role of the black woman, how they are the caretakers of culture? If you read these articles today, they are very relevant to today's time. And I found it's like, okay, this was done about 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, and they're still relevant. The publication went on, I think, through uh, the early 1900s and then it disbanded, but it had a start in Evanston. Um, by the way, William Twigg's granddaughter was Kay Davis, who sang for Duke Ellington. Some of the songs she really sang was uh, Brown Penny, Minnie Ha Ha, On Turquoise Cloud, and she was a vocal behind Al Hibbler's Nothing But the Blues. So the community was growing in the North Shore. Evanston, Glencoe, and Lake Forest were the main established communities that black migrants were moving to directly from the south and from Canada directly to these cities. Uh, there was a Methodist movement that was advocating for this. Um, there was a safe haven here, and there was opportunities for jobs, built, buying land, building their own homes, uh, great education uh, opportunities. It was all right there. So it was no, by, by no you know, accident that the communities, especially in Evanston, grew quite quickly. In 1860, there were two, Hetty Corn and Maria Murray. By 1900, 737. By 1910, um, 1,160. And this is a time when Evanston and North Shore communities are saying, hmm, this is a problem. There are too many black folks coming into the North Shore. What do we do about this? 
and the onset of Jim Crow law sort of taking hold in effect, uh, Kenilworth uh, established itself as a sundown town. And um, how many of you are familiar with what a sundown town is? Okay, it's a few people. So um, sundown town basically meant that, like, especially right now, nightfall, and if Glenview was a sundown town, I should not be here. I would have to leave. And if I did not leave, I could face being arrested. So as you see this population in Evanston in particular in this conversation, uh, by 1930, there was close to 5,000 black residents in Evanston. And there was a sudden boom that part of it was helped with a tragedy that happened in Abbeville, South Carolina, uh, with the lynching of Anthony Crawford. He was a wealthy uh, landowner in Abbeville in the 19, early 1900s. He owned 400 acres of land. He funded, he was basically building a community on his property, farming it and building a community. He had his own church, a schoolhouse, um, building houses for family members and other residents that lived there and worked the land. One season, he had a bump crop, and he went to uh, sell his proceeds downtown Abbeville. He was second in line. He was asked to step out of line, and he refused. He was drug out of line, and the fight broke out. He won the fight, but he was dragged into jail. Middle of the night, he was dragged out of jail, tied behind a wagon, tortured, shot at, cut, and hung. 30 days later, a newspaper article went out claiming to the rest of the community that you have 30 days to leave or we cannot guarantee your safety in this community. So there was a huge migration of Abbeyvillian black uh, community to New York, Detroit, and Evanston. And during the 1920s and 30s, that's where that big boom happened. The land only changed hands three times. The first initial land grab, then sold to a paper mill, and then that paper mill sold to another paper mill. There was one of our board members that did a lot of research, because it happened to be her great-great-grandfather. And um, she was doing a lot of research, and ended up getting an apology from Congress uh, about uh, lynching in the, state of, uh, in, in the United States. His, Anthony Crawford's name was in, immortalized uh, just last year. There was a marker that was put up in Abbeville, South Carolina to commemorate his legacy. However, the family will in no way be able to recover the land that was stolen from them. So that's 400 acres of land that's now gone. Again, as I was talking about, we've been talking a lot about Evanston, Glencoe Lake Forest, but I am promising I have some things for Glenview. Uh, the Emerson Street Branch YMCA established itself as a base station for the black community. Uh, established itself in 1909, had its first facility in 1914, and became the hub of African American life in the North Shore. It's a service Evanston, but also Glencoe, Lake Forest, Rogers Park, and had a lot of connections within Chicago at Wabash Y, and, um, and brought in a lot of interesting people to Evanston at the time. Um, it started because, and this was our second project I started working on when I started to establish Shorefront. Uh, what I want to do with Shorefront is correct a lot of histories that were incorrectly written. And the way the Emerson Street branch was uh, uh, discussed and, 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 and talked about in historical context, uh, written by the McGall YMCA, was that these two white philanthropists came along and saw the needs to service the black community, so they established a black branch to service that community. But what really happened was that there was a gentleman by the name of James Talley that came from Virginia in 1907 and tried to join the, Emerson, the Bogal YMCA. It's now called the Bogal YMCA, so I'll just use that uh, to keep cut confusion. Um, but he was denied uh, membership because of the color of his skin. But uh, undeterred, because he was a member of the YMCA in Virginia at the time, he organized a bunch of businessmen and youth and did Y activities in vacant lots and behind businesses. And this embarrassed the McGall Y, and they asked him to come back and say, you know what, we would like to hire you as our first black employee, and you're going to start a, the model for a separate facility. And that, coupled with the Julius Rosenwald Fund in 1914, they did a lot of fundraising and established his first building, which you see there in the picture opened in 1914, 
July 5th, 1914, they sold tickets for the grand opening, uh, $2 a piece. They sold 400 tickets, only 200 people could fit inside, so there's a lot of people outside. Um, but they already knew at that time when it opened, it was too small to really service the community it was designated for. By 1930, they, uh, with the help of additional funding and fundraising, the Magal YMCA moved this location. They raised $1.1 million. $1 million for the new Magal YMCA and $100,000 to expand this facility here. So this facility then served as a surrogate dormitory for black students attending Northwestern University as they could not stay on campus. This was also the site of daycares, job training, um, a lot of churches started their organization, their church at this facility. Um, so you had W.D. Boys that uh, uh, came here to visit to stay here at the YMCA and do lectures. And Ralph Bunch, as he was doing his res residency at Northwestern, stayed at this Magal at this Emerson Street Branch YMCA for four months, as he couldn't live on campus. And we do in our archive have a, uh, a letter that he wrote back to Howard University using a Howard letterhead, but with Emerson Street Branch Street address. I was fortunate with one of our board members, Rose Jordan. Uh, she was the daughter of Elvin Jordan, which I'll mention in a minute, um, who talked about Ralph Bunch's visits, because he would go over to their house and eat dinner, along with W.B. Du Bois and many other dignitaries that came into Evanston. And Rose would just tell these great stories about what was discussed at the table. And Rose, if, if you knew Rose, she could not keep her mouth shut, even as a young lady. So, you know, at this time period, you know, men are at the table, they talk, women should be quiet. She was not quiet. <laughs> not at all. She would ask questions, her mom was trying to shut her down. And she's like, no, I still got some more questions. What's going on with the Civil Rights Movement? What's going on with this? Why is your opinion about these activities happening? And so she was really engaged with this. And just to hear her stories later on in life was quite interesting. Um, there was a lot going on, as I mentioned, there was Jim Crow and the early stats that I talked about with Illinois almost becoming a slave state. What was interesting about the North Shore black community is that they weren't just settled with that status quo. They fought every step of the way. The NAACP established itself in 1912. Evanston already had a chapter of NAACP in 1918. They were fighting Jim Crow of the area of uh, Evanston and the North Shore, especially when it came to housing, uh, segregated trolley cars, movie theaters, and other activities that were slated for public uh, venture. Well, Matt had a big discussion about, you know, what's going to happen with the housing here, and what, what landlord is selling property to Negroes. What are we going to do with the Negro population that's growing so fast? Maybe we should move them out and move them into unincorporated Niles. How do we control this population that went on for decades. And the side effect of that, it created segregated communities and segregated facilities that had a long-lasting impact to this day. Um, but the community always band together and fought back. Uh, when I started researching the NAACP uh, chapter in Evanston, I had a hard time trying to figure out why isn't this talked about more? And it occurred to me that sometimes when a new organization starts, generic terms are used. And the BCP was relatively new. There were a lot of other clubs that were doing a lot of similar things of the NAACP, fighting for equal rights, uh, taking uh, families and, and uh, municipalities to court. So a lot of times in early newspapers, the NAACP was referred to as the new colored organization or the new colored interest. And I found that interesting. Once I found that term and I saw these names that kept on popping up over and over again, I realized that these were the early members of that chapter of NAACP. Uh, one fight that happened in Glencoe was uh, desegregating one of the beaches. Uh, there was a Negroes only beach in uh, uh, Glencoe. And one family, because you know, the Foster family, they pay taxes in Glencoe, they should be able to go into uh, any beach they want especially since now they started selling beach tokens. So she bought, they bought beach tokens to a whites-only beach and challenged the court and won. 
This photograph you see here was the uh, Black Only speech at the Inglenco at the time. Owen B. Jordan Jr. came to Lovingston in the 1920s. He was a graduate from Harvard University. His father was Owen B. Jordan Sr., who was one of the founding members of the Niagara Movement, which led to the founding and establishment of the NAACP. So there's that big tie right there. Uh, Jordan came to Evanston to attend Northwestern uh, for journalism school. I think he spent one month in class. Mm -hmm. He got a job as the managing editor of the Chicago Bee and the sports editor of the Chicago Defender. Where his real call came was when he ran for office as Evanston's first African-American alderman. 1929, he was compelled to run as he saw a community that was in need of black leadership, especially when you have current, uh, the current establishment that was just marginalizing the uh, African community at that time, splitting up the wards, redlining, rezoning, just to keep the vote at a minimum impact. Uh, people were buying votes, uh, the politicians were buying votes from the black population, saying, oh, here's a, a, a pint of whiskey, vote for me. You know, I'll guarantee you a job if you vote for me. Jordan was sick of that. He said, you know what, I'm going to run. And what his talent in galvanizing a community was remarkable. But it wasn't unusual for him. Because while he was at Harvard, he took the charge of desegregating the dormitories on Harvard's campus. He took the task, the dean of Harvard University at that time, and challenged them about ethics. This is a top school and you're dealing with antiquated laws. Challenged it, made national papers, and ended up desegregating many of the dorms at Harvard University. Took that same process and brought it to Evanston. Utilized all the latest technology at the time. He started a newspaper, just advertised for himself using telegrams. Getting letters of recommendations from all over the country about his, what he has done um, in his career. Election night, he won. By midnight, he was unseated, accused of voter fraud. The incumbent said there's no way he could have won. He even took him to trial. This is kind of like similar. Now I'm hearing the same thing in today's politics. <laughs> so the incumbent took him to court saying, you did um, um, cheat, and I'm going to prove that you did. After court filings and after interviewing a whole lot of people and redoing a recount, realized he did not. He said, that's OK. I'm going to run again in two years when his seat comes up again. But this time, there was two seats in for each ward, a senior and a junior alderman. So he said, both seats are coming up for election. I'm going to run for the senior seat. And he brought in a partner, the first female alderwoman of Evanston. Here we go. <laughs> Won again by a larger margin. And he held seat for 17 years. In his term there, he helped desegregate the uh, beaches, fought policies against uh, socially illegal baseball games, mixed baseball games. And I have a fun time kind of explaining this to kids, because they're trying to fight for the life of them, trying to figure out like, why, why is a baseball game illegal to have like, black players play against white players? Why is that socially unacceptable? I said, well, what do you have to do to tag a person out? You have to tag them out. That's striking a white man. And at that time, the Jim Crow laws, that's an offense. They can get arrested for it. So he would have mixed games on purpose. He wore his automatic badge and says, I dare you to arrest me. I am having this game. And what he did when he took it to court was that he cited that these are public parks with taxpayers that pay for these public parks. And if you impose this type of law, what does that say? This is a huge lawsuit against you. So of course, that's really led for that. But what they started doing was every time you wanted to play a game or use the park with a group of people, you had to put in a request to the city and get permission from the city. That's how they vetted it all over again. Oh, you want to have a baseball game? Well, we're not too sure about that. I think the field was occupied at that time, so you can't do it. Another fun uh, article that I had a great time doing some research on, and I'm still doing constant research on this, is uh, Dorothy Byan. 
uh, graduate of Evanston Township High School and went on to Howard University. And she worked the uh, admissions office when a young Malaku Bayan came to register at that school to finish his uh, degree to become a physician. He was the nephew of King Haile Selassie. He was already engaged to somebody else in Ethiopia. Met Dorothy Bayan and said, hey, <laughs> what's your name? I'm a prince, you know. <laughs> Three months later, they were married. And what they embarked on after that was advocacy. So I think many of you heard of Marcus Garvey, uh, back to the Africa movement. Well, there was something similar with the Ethiopian movement, too. Assisting Ethiopia as it was fighting the Italian regime invading the country. So Dr. Bayan and Dorothy Bayan would travel the world United States, Harlem, and Chicago, England, Addis Ababa, to raise funds to help support the war. Her papers uh, that she wrote back to her sisters in Evanston are housed at Yale University. I got to read some of them. And they're quite funny, because you'll talk about, well, we went to go see the king and the queen today, and I have my outfit on in this long train. I just hope to God I don't trip. <laughs> They had a son, and the, uh, the king and queen had a son, too, and they played together. Uh, both her and her husband uh, started the uh, Ethiopian World Federation and the Ethiopian Star newspaper, which both still exist today. And we found some new letterhead with her name inscribed at the top of the uh, Ethiopian World Federation. She was known as the war correspondent. She went under the name Princess Malakubayan. I'm hoping I find more pictures. If I can find that wedding picture, that'd be great. <laughs> Fred Hutcherson, uh, another fun fact I like to talk with teenagers especially. Um, a lot of teenagers, you know, I'll go into a high school and say, hey, how many of you would like to have your own car right now? Everybody's raising their hand. How many of you have your own car? And people would raise their hand. And I said, well, this gentleman here, while he was in high school, his father bought him an airplane. How cool is that? You know, mouse drop and talk about all his adventures, what he did. He's self-taught aviator at age of uh, 16, 17 years old. He ended up teaching other pilots how to fly at age 19 in different airports throughout the uh, Chicago metropolitan area. He wanted to fly in the United States but was not allowed to. So he moved his family to Canada and flew for the Royal Canadian Air Force and had his training there. His job was to ferry Spitfires and bombers across seas, and probably become the third African American to navigate across the Atlantic Ocean. He later uh, had a, char a flight charter um, a business. He tried to start an air um, airline in Port au Prince, Haiti, but instead uh, chartered a uh, flight school down there. He was the first pilot for South American Airlines and the first African American pilot for British Airlines. Um, he logged in over 30,000 hours of flight time. He was picked up by the Pittsburgh Courier. Uh, sometimes he would have radio broadcasts with his adventures flying across the Atlantic Ocean. And with a little bit of embellishment, we would talk about these heroin experiences about flying across the Atlantic Ocean and the fuel gauges were freezing up and they were losing altitude and got about 100 feet above the water and suddenly the engine kicked back on and made it safely to the land in England. I don't know how much was that embellishment, but you know, if you just imagine, it made some interesting reading at that time. Uh, he had a float, a, a woman's skill, and had a float at the Bud Billikens Parade that won multiple awards. And he lived and died flying. Three months after he finished flying and retired from that, he passed away in Evanston. His son lived on in Rockford, Illinois, and this is where I was able to get a lot of information firsthand from his son, who followed part of his career while he also served in the military as a photographer. Kay Davis, as I mentioned before, the granddaughter of William Twiggs, who sang with Duke Ellington. And I also had the pleasure of meeting her before she passed on. Uh, I traveled down to Florida to her home, and I think it was the first time I felt severely underdressed. So she came out of this nice home with gay, I mean, this was like out of a fairy tale. Gates opened up, flowers over the place, I think birds were talking to me, and, and I'm there in khaki shorts and a t-shirt. I'm like, can I, can I come back in about an hour? And Ted, no, she invited me in and just uh, 
turned out she was a wonderful caterer and she had this lavish setup for me and we spoke for six hours interviewing her. And she talked about her experience uh, singing with Duke Ellington and how that happened. And I did ask that question. I said, well, she attended Northwest University Music School, um, but a week before her graduation, she went to a Duke Ellington concert. Um, and again, with kids, I have to explain this a little bit. I have to break it down a little bit different. So, well, he was Jay-Z at his time, you know, the Michael Jackson. I'm trying to connect with them. I'm showing my age now. Um, and they're not getting it yet. So, okay, uh, Kendrick Lamar? Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> so, she was there. Um, saw the concert on a dare and went backstage to meet the Gullington. And, you know, I kind of like made up this little conversation. Oh, hi, I'm your biggest fan. You know, I sing too. Maybe you can see me. I'm singing next week at, uh, at Northwestern. And that was the end of that uh, discussion. Next week, she did her graduation performance at Northwestern. And a round of applause. She was leaving the stage, but the applause got louder and louder. It turned out that Duke Ellington and his band were walking on the aisle saying, can you be in Boston next week? So she performed with Duke Ellington for seven years. Her crowning achievement was performing at Carnegie Hall, but that was probably her last performance. After the concert, she and the band went across the street to go eat at a restaurant and was refused service because of the color of their skin. So she had to go back to Carnegie Hall, sit in her dressing room with a candle and a, uh, and a can of beans. That was her dinner. And after that, she retired. So after all that, this is all I can do. So she retired and spent the rest of her life uh, making hats and started a catering business. We still talk fondly about just how her experience working with uh, Duke Ellington. Honorable Lorraine Morton, um, she is 99 years old right now. And uh, she was a lifelong a, a, a teacher, then principal, alderman, and then became Evanston's first African-American mayor, served for 17 years. She is a riot. I don't know if you ever get a chance to meet her, but you know, bring a sandwich, you can change clothes, because she's going to keep you in company for a long time. Right now, Shorefront is working on a documentary on her life, and we're almost finished with this. And maybe if I have a chance, I could play the trailer before we leave tonight. Um, but just seeing the work that she has done through her lifetime and how she engaged people during difficulties. And at the time when she was serving, Northwest University in Evanston had a very bad relationship. <coughs> she mended that relationship. She always brought people with different backgrounds, different ideas, different political views, and got them all at the same table to work on common goals. And she had a knack for that. Uh, about a month ago, we interviewed her again um, in a public forum, and I asked her the question, who is your biggest influence? And she kind of joked around and said, well, all my influences are dead, but I'm, I'm 99, I can't think of anybody, but the people who influence me the most are today's youth, unfiltered and powerful. And every time I talk to our youth today, I learn something new. Mind you, she's 99 years old and she's still driving. And makes every event that she's invited to, dressed to the nines. So if you come across her, be sure you're, you know, this, this is still considered not dressed enough. I better be in a suit. Asa Taylor, uh, Glencoe resident. Uh, he was an inventor and machinist. Uh, he developed a prototype of the hydraulic hospital beds in his garage in Glencoe. The family had the patent for a while, but there was a partnership when the family gave the patent to the other family, not realizing the value of the patents at the time. This was just one of the inventors he's dead. His father also was an inventor, and there's about maybe half a dozen or so patents in their name. Homer Wilson uh, established the uh, uh, first uh, black church in Glencoe, Illinois, uh, in St. Paul Amy Church in eight, um, 1884. Uh, the church started in his home, and then they moved into their own structure. There are still family members, family descendants that still live in Glencoe today that are related to Homer Wilson. And Walker Sales, who was Lake Forest's first African-American police officer. The bigger picture of this, you'll see him standing next to a Harley motorcycle. He had the night shift. 
There's two officers in Lake Forest. He was the second one. And Samuel Dent, who's an entrepreneur, owner-operator of a livery stable in Lake Forest, Illinois. Um, there is a jazz band that's named after him in Lake Forest that still performs. Um, this was a, a, a also a practice in retelling local history. Because that's when I went to Lake Forest, they do these historic walks through their cemetery. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a cemetery that has not been segregated. So Samuel does bury it there and a few other early black settlers who live um, buried there as well. And they would do these reenactments. And then when it came to Samuel Dent and the Matthews family, the reenactors went into a slave dialect. And of course, I'm standing there going like, how do you know they had a slave dialect? And it's causing pause. And so if you think about this, I mean, not necessarily Samuel Dent, but the Matthews family, who owned a restaurant, an ice cream parlor, trained horses, ran a livery business. As they started there in Lake Forest, they worked for the dean of Lake Forest College. Do you think with somebody of that caliber that would have a slave dialect? So from that point on, they changed the narration away from the slave dialect. Just cause a question. It's like, just think beyond the box here. So established communities in the North Shore were developing clubs, organizations, churches, a lot of firsts, a lot of activity that happened, a lot of things that happened in the North Shore that impacted the national uh, discourse in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of stories like that. I can't get into it in all this time that we have here, but know that like Dr. Martin King Jr. came to the North Shore on three different occasions to fight housing. Um, we have a lot of existing organizations that have been around for multiple, multiple decades. And in this photograph, you see the woman on your left, front row, that is Lorraine Morton. Um, and I will have to kind of point out in the middle, right there in the middle, that's my mom, so. <laughs> I have to point that out. But these are like the movers and shakers are still very active and engaged in the, the North Shore community. And when I say the North Shore, North Evanston, as far north as Waukegan, far west as Schaumburg, there is a collective of communities that gather quite often to partner in different activities and organizations. Uh, this uh, group here is the North Shore chapter of the Lynx Incorporated uh, Professional Black Women. So today's North Shore, uh, the black population is actually kind of seeing the decline right now um, in Evanston. Uh, in some areas, it's rising a little bit. Um, and some of them have kind of remained the same. Kenilworth kind of remains around that 0.2% um, for people. I think now it's up to seven. <laughs> Woo! Moving in. <laughs> Um, Evanston actually had a decline from about 16,000 to now about 13,000. Highland Park is actually increasing. Uh, Lake Forest is kind of remaining stable. Glencoe has gone down. Um, this is a 2010 census. You can kind of see some of the shift there. I'll do a side by side. Of 2010, 2000, 20, uh, 2010, you can see the shifts in population. So about a few weeks ago, I started doing some stats about Glenview, and Glenview's a black population as well, because I just wanted to see what was happening here in Glenview. Um, it was interesting, you know, what, what was happening. I saw these population shifts, uh, the black population shifts in Glenview. And I think this, kind of, this grid kind of shows what it looked like. Uh, 1930, zero, okay, the 1960, 14, 1970, 17, 1980, 279. And then a small dip, and then in 2000, 663, and then a dip again in 2010. Uh, I think projected out for 2017 is roughly around the same number as we have today. Yes? What changed in 2000 that there was such a leap? Good question. It could be that new development. So in 1995, we had the closing of the base, you had the Glen that opened up, you had a lot of development that was happening around the time. Now, when I lived here, it was in the 70s. And I thought I was the only black person in Glenview. There were 16. There were six, I was, the 17, there were, there's four in my family, so there were 13 others. <laughs> um, 
And you know, Pleasant Ridge, I integrated my school. Um, but I did find some interesting things. Glenview Naval Air Station uh, was um, the place where Jesse L. Brown trained for one month for officer uh, flight school. He, um, he had to prepare himself coming to Glenview. And what is said in his autobiography that he yelled in the mirror the N-word several times really loud to get used to being called that while, at the training, while during training. He fought in the Korean War. He crashed in China after uh, a, a, a run um, with some gunfire, probably cut his whole um, fuel line, and he crashed. His wingman stayed with him because he survived the crash, but he was pinned, and they couldn't get him out. And so by the time rescuers came, it was hours and hours, and you know the temperature was dropping, they were freezing, and he knew that if they even tried to get him out there, he was probably going to lose uh, his life, uh, loss of blood. So. Uh, his wingman, Hunter, um, in honoring him, uh, the United States awarded him with a uh, medal for his bravery and sticking by his, um, his uh, pilot. Um, and he was also awarded about $6,000, which then he turned over to the widow of Jesse Brown. Margot Robinson, my mom, was the first black teacher in School District 30. And my mom tells me a story. I remember asking her one day, I said, what was that like? She said, well, the principal and the vice principal came out to pick me up and toured me to all the schools. I said, this is Margot Robinson, this is her new teacher. And she remained at the uh, Willowbrook School for her entire career. I think she had enough credentials to become principal, and she was offered that, but she declined it. She loved teaching kids. So she taught first grade, third grade, and retired teaching fifth grade. Um, every so often, when I was a young kid and she first started teaching, I was, if I had a day off, I would say, I would come to the classroom with her and sit in class and watch her teach. Um, but it was just interesting at these times, and I think Christmas was really cool to watch her because all the students would give her all these presents. And so Christmas time, you know, here's me and my brother getting our toys. My dad got his stuff, you know, his electronic devices and cameras and stuff. My mom had this pile of loot. <laughs> and at the time when she was teaching, the wave then was anything made out of acrylic, it was a gift. <laughs> we had everything in acrylic, acrylic clipboards, uh, dust pans, uh, note holders, apples, paperweights, uh, keychain holders. If it was acrylic, if you're making an acrylic, she had it. <laughs> she was elected president of District 30 Teachers Association and served as a district regional representative. <laughs> and um, my life in Glenview, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I remember since childhood, uh, where I, we, I, I was born in Chicago, we lived in Roseland, south side of Chicago, and I remember my dad coming home one day, I was about four years old, five years old, and he said, that's it, we're moving. And I spent a few nights at my grandparents' house, and then my parents came home one night and said, okay, it's time to go home to your new home. So we got in the car, and this was in Inglewood, driving down the uh, expressway, trying to stay awake because I was curious, like, where are we going? And we pull into a driveway on 1631 Sunset Ridge Road, our new house, and slept in my room, that, my, oh, my first room in that, that, that same night. Wake up the next day, like, what is going to happen with me? What is this new environment? Um, school hasn't started quite started yet. It was a month out. My brother, my older brother, was uh, enrolled at Poco Loco, <laughs> which today we still, you know, really joke about. It's like, why are we at a daycare called Crazy Kids? <laughs> <laughs> that just puzzled me. So I spent, you know, like the first month there at Poco Loco, and you know, they always tried to make me take a nap, and I never took naps at the time, so I was just a handful because I would just talk and play with toys and, hey, Legos and Lincoln Logs, that was my thing. Um, my consciousness developed at an early age about who I am and what this world was like. And this is my kindergarten class picture. I look cute there, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> um, but this was also my awakening to uh, societal uh, differences. And there was a student in here that came up to me as I was sitting on the ground about a few feet away from the kindergarten teacher uh, making this clay car. And I was proud of it. It was like this big, that looked like the Flintstones car, but in my mind it looked like a Ferrari. 
So take that picture there. And I was sitting there just working really hard on this. And this kid came up to me, looked down on me, stomped on my clay car, and said, niggas are not allowed to play with toys. And then he kicked me in the stomach. The teacher looked at me and then looked away. And I had a decision to make that day. Um, I went home. I did not tell my parents about what happened. Cried in bed. And I cried for a long time. And I cried until I got mad. I said, you know what? This is not going to happen anymore. So when I look back on this and I reflect back on it, I say, I could have gone down three different paths. I could have gone into myself and just be reclusive. I could have lashed out in anger from then on. But actually, I was really constructive. I said, you know, one, nobody's ever going to call me that again and get away with it. And two, nobody can tell me what I can and can't do. And fortunately, at Pleasant Ridge Elementary School, I had a pretty decent support structure. Uh, the principal then was Dix Prudane, who I had the pleasure of meeting again three years ago. We had coffee together. Um, and we just shared stories. Because he knew that if I was called into the principal's office, it's because that one kid that kicked me in the stomach in kindergarten, because every year we had a little scuffle. He was the, he was the school bully. And I was like the do-right kid that every time I tried to do somebody wrong, I had to stand up for the person who was being the victim. So I'll get into the principal's office because we're both called there. I'm furious. The principal's always saying, Dino, calm down. Your mom is coming to get you. Don't worry about it. You, on the other hand, bully, you're suspended for a couple of days. But that went on repeated over and over again every year. Um, and I say this, there was like a lot of ups and downs with that. Some great teachers there that really encouraged me to move forward. Um, and unfortunately, I can't remember all the names of them, but I remember one teacher that she had these buttons that she would make. And if you did something right, you get a button that says, you are an XB kid. And man, I, every student wanted to get that button. And one day I had two of those buttons, and I was so proud of myself. But, um, but I had other teachers, too, that would say, you're black, you're not allowed to learn. I want to talk to your parents because I think you need special ed help. You need to see a psychiatrist. So this is the 70s. Um, and my whole school career here kind of was kind of interesting. Uh, played in Glen Oak Acres, and that was a lot of fun. That was like the hub of play for all kids. This is one time like you send your kids out, crack a dog in the morning, and says don't come back until the sun goes down. We did that. We ate at people's houses, you know. And, had bologna sandwiches at families' homes that I had no idea who they were. <laughs> How many families would do that now? Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> um, but that, those were really interesting days of my time. And then, then we moved to, uh, in 1980, we moved to Evanston. And for the first time, I'm like, wow, more people like me. And it caused a lot of reflection. I think it helped shape me who I am today. And especially with the formation of Shorefront and some of the philosophies we had behind that. And one of the things I want to do was say that we are an organization that documents American history. Our subject matter is out of the African experience. I told my board that I want one name. Because a lot of times when you put African American in it, you get this long name, this African American heritage society, the African American culture and heritage institution it gets broken down to an acronym that nobody can pronounce right and nobody can remember the name again. I said, I want one word. And after a lot of brainstorming and working with a lot of um, uh, professors and dealing with Venn diagrams and models and doing all these different things, we came up with Shorefront. And our mission is simply Shorefront preserves, collects, preserves, and educates people about black history on Chicago's suburban North Shore. And we were intentional in using black um, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, I look back at my birth certificate. It does say black. My brother, my younger brother, is African American. My parents are Negro. And my grandparents are colored. And also, we didn't want to isolate a segment of the community. We're not monolithic. Um, there is a large Jamaican and Haitian Caribbean community. If you say Afro American, you're excluding that population. Um, didn't want to use diaspora. So okay, that's a little highbrow and you know, barely spell it half the time. And, <laughs> but we want to keep it simple and approachable. And so, and in our group that was just deliberating on that was myself, a scholar from Northwestern, and a business person. 
So it was African American, oh, black, uh, mixed race, and Caucasian. And it was really funny watching my friend who was Caucasian really struggle with his terminology and trying to remain politically correct. And so we had a good time with her, um, struggling. Um, her impediment was that she does not like being referred to or any woman being referred to as girl. Understandable. And so as she was struggling with like how she's going to define this and trying to use the right word and how to use it, I just kind of looked at her and said, girl, relax. <laughs> and she went, uh, got it. And so from then on, we were able to just really smoothly get along with this. And um, after working out all the definitions and reasons why, and philosophically, the reasons why we did some things we stuck with black in our mission statement. And from there, we grew in 19, um, 2002. That started on my dining room table. And I have to compliment my wife for being extremely patient with me as my collection went from three folders that I updated from, from color to black. Um, to a box of stuff, to boxes of stuff. Now, this is all accumulating in the dining room now. <laughs> and my wife is a nice decorator. She likes to keep things clean and you know, neat. And every time I come with a new box, I kind of smile really big and say, I promise to move these, which sometimes does not happen fast enough. But as we grew, and we grew this network of people, um, as I was talking to people, we developed a uh, working group uh, that went in the community and started capturing these stories and creating documentation, creating an archive that is ran by the community. And we thought this was an important process because we have a large territory to cover. So if you think about it, we have Evanston North to Lake Forest. That's about 40 miles. And then we're starting to head west, you know, Glenview and Palatine and uh, Arlington Heights uh, with early African American settlement. Uh, you can see a lot of firsts. Deerfield um, had its first African American family in the 1960s. Um, uh, Kenilworth had the first black family in the 1960s that had some extremely um, personal stories to tell about their experiences, why they came to the North Shore, their involvement in the North Shore, and the things in, in, in the walls that, in the barriers that uh, presented themselves at the time. But to capture these stories and these history really enlightens a lot and kind of sets a dialogue for a lot of the discussions that we're having today about diversity and equity. We want to bring all those things to the forefront. So we start building an archive. I uh, started with, again, with my three file folders, two um, archival boxes. Uh, we eventually uh, started a partnership with the um, uh, Chicago Black Metropolis Research Consortium. Uh, they were focused on institutions like the Chicago History Museum, Northwestern University, IIT, Roosevelt, DuSable. But I started calling them and saying, you know what, you're missing a big part if you don't capture community historians and community repositories. And they kind of blew us off for about a year, a year and a half, until one day they were coming up to the Evanston History Center to do some work. And they decided to just swing by real quick, that's the quote, to Shorefront and see what we were doing. Because they figured that if they can assess us, they'll take you know, maybe about a half hour. So as they were coming, the process were coming out of the hall, and they greeted me, this is me in jeans and locks. Halfway through our presentation, our conversation, uh, the process will stop and say, you know what? I have to apologize because when I was coming here, all I was thinking about was we would come to Evanston and see this community archive and talk to this old man in a scraggly tweed jacket with a box full of newspaper clippings um, talking about the good old days. But then I see you and what you've done here. And then he gets on the phone and calls Emerson History Center and says, uh, sorry, we're not going to come today. No, we're going to reschedule for a couple of, months, a couple of months down the line. So we became their model for what a community archive looks like, how we operate. And from then on, we kind of went even further. We started talking on a national level about the importance of community archives and how important it is to keep community archives independent from institutions. And when you talk about partnerships with organizations like, uh, like Northwestern or Chicago History Museum or even the Evanston History Center, um, the equity part of it is a lot of times these bigger institutions will come to a small community archive and say, hey, we want to partner with you. 
And that partnership really entails that we're going to get the grant money, we're going to pay our employees, we're going to mine our archives, take what we need, and bring it back to ours. Believe me, that's what. I fight, we short front fights back against that. So no, a true partnership is we come to the table together and develop an idea to work together, write grants together, benefit from the financial benefit in maintaining this archive, and seeing how we can partner and make sure that these archives go into the places that it needs to go to. Or with the example of Shorefront, that since we already have a collection, that we're able to maintain that and continue that on and keep it growing. So with our work, a lot of these institutions now are kind of copying what Shorefront is doing, becoming active collectors again, going out in the community and doing oral histories, digging, asking the right questions. Not just the famous people, oh yes, you were the first alderman of the, the Fifth Ward in Evanston, but also the local domestic. What did you do here? What was your place here in Evanston? What made you come to the North Shore? What did you do while you were here? And when you start pulling those stories out, and you're able to align yourself with them, and understand what that history is and what they went through, you get a deeper story. If you kind of go in cold and say, hey, I'm the professor at such and such institution, and we came here to learn about your history, I guarantee you will get the surface story. Yes, well, I grew up here, it was nice, uh, I went to school here and I got a job, and yes, everything's nice. But when you identify and know part of their history and able to use nicknames of people they grew up with and the old haunts that they went to, they said, oh, you know what's going on, so let me tell you the real story of what happened here. Now, I remember, you know, uh, shortstop who used to hang over at this, you know, so we have these type of stories that open up a whole new world of activity. And that's what we try and capture. We have over 100 hours of audio oral histories, and we're accumulating about maybe 25 to 30 hours of video. Uh, we have uh, photographs that date back to the late 1800s. We have documentation that date back to 1880s that were generated by and about the growing black community in the suburban North Shore. Um, we have become a resource for entities to utilize our findings. Our first um, acknowledgement was in Rachel Swarn's book, American Tapestry, on the life of uh, the family lineage of uh, Michelle Obama. Turns out that her great-grandmother lived in Evanston for a short period of time. And the neighborhood that she grew up in was raised uh, um, to make way for new development. They basically picked up a whole black community and told them to move so we could do this new development. But she interviewed Shorefront to figure out what the community was like at the time and ended up being cited and quoted in her book. Cool. Uh, Friends Disappear was the work of Mary Barr, who was a daughter of Evanston's first female mayor in the 1980s. Uh, and she talked about the racial disparities and equities of education in Evanston. Uh, poet Parnisha Jones uh, with her book Vessel, and she wrote a specific poem in support of Shorefront in her first publication. And we're sort of do documentary films. Um, Alex Trigay's Ordinary People and her work with um, Black Busing in Chicago and the, the birth of the Operation Bad Basket that became Operation Push. And the, uh, the, uh, the curriculum she developed in Operation Push that trained uh, leaders in social engagement and civil, civic engagement. Um, the one that we're working on now, I mentioned before, is uh, on Lorraine Morton, and this is for a South American mayor. Um, that's a lot of work and a lot of photographs. I have a lot of stories behind that one, but that's another day. <laughs> um, and we get around the country. So um, I've been speaking at different campuses. Uh, next month, I'll be at Harvard University speaking on uh, the, the importance of community archives and equity with um, uh, institutions. And then again at um, uh, North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina, uh, talking about some of the topics down there about African American communities. Uh, I've spoken at the uh, Schomburg in New York, um, University of Michigan, Northwestern University, University of Chicago, all generally about the importance of community archives, how we do it, and what's done with that. Um, we work with a lot of youth. Um, especially uh, high school students with uh, research projects where we become a first-hand 
uh, our first resource for a lot of information. And we also offer internships for uh, college students uh, and master's students getting their PhD. We have two right now, one from Dominican and one coming from Northwest Universities to fulfill their practicum. And what they like about these collections is that um, some of these interns I've heard from in the past will go into other institutions saying, yes, I went into this entity and I went and reprocessed one of the collections they've had for decades. You know, and I just kind of go through the whole process. The interns that we have with Shorefront, they leave knowing that one, they process a collection that nobody's ever seen before and have a chance to interface with the families that donated that. And we give them complete control of it. If they need something, I say, oh, let me just make a full quick phone call. I mean, it's, it's weird that I'm sitting here on my phone and I have the phone numbers of the current Evanston mayor, the former Evanston mayor, and two other mayors before her. And they're all calling me like, hey, we have some questions about local history. What can we do? This is, and, and in many organizations across the country, you have a, a, a budding um, organizations of community archives are coming to fruition. And a lot of entities are now starting to follow a model of what Shorefront has done. Um, we're all volunteer, we all have full-time jobs, and what we do with, and I'll tell you this, so our budget, our annual budget that we work off of averages about twenty-five to $30,000 a year. And our board are made up of people, professional people with very specific skill sets. You know, I'm a graphic designer and historian. We have a videographer, we have a musician, we have attorneys, uh, we have real estate developers, we have planners. All coming to the table for one goal is to capture a history that has been ignored for decades and throughout its entire history of the North Shore. So we just want to bring this to the forefront and we hope that our model can emulate, be emulated with other entities, whatever that entity may be. Um, what we fight also against is uh, sometimes uh, Shorefront, you know, some entities try to make Shorefront to end all, be all for all ethnicities. Why don't you capture the, the Hispanic neighborhood? And I said, well, that's not what we do. But we can be a model for the Hispanic community. If they want to do something like this, we'll give them whatever they need to get it started. But it has to be on their terms and in their own voice. That's the important part. Um, I can't talk on behalf of the, Af of the Hispanic community, nor will I ever want to. I can't be the voice of a organization. I can't be the voice of the, the League of Women Voters. That's going to look kind of odd, you know. <laughs> I know I'm going to say something wrong. I want to get all these stares at me, and I want to duck behind this podium. So I'm not going to have that happen. It's important that the, the, the dialogue and the narrative from these organizations are, originate from those organizations. And that's part of our vision with Shorefront. Along with you know, keeping history is uh, making our history common knowledge, but also being that voice within that community. Um, we engage the community. We have an uh, online blog uh, where people who are doing research initiatives can write short articles and have them published. And I have a few copies of the hard copies on the tables over there. Um, we used to be a printed journal that we came out every quarter and we only printed about 300, so our reach was limited. But when we took it online, our general reach per month is about 750 people, or 750, 750 hits. Um, and people respond to them too, so as we write articles about certain things, people will come and say, hey, I knew that person and I have this information as well, I'll bring it over. So this has become a, a, a conduit for acquiring new collections to our archive and engaging people. There are family members that we reconnected through this um, journal. And we have a lot of guest writers that come in and do this. We have finding aids on our website, so you can download these finding aids and see what we have in our collection. Um, and we want people to do something with them. So our, our archives live, and we always um, keep ourselves in this state of discovery where we don't close an archive simply because we amass this collection and now we're going to process it and then leave it alone. We don't know what's out there still. And so we want to keep the archives open and we build on those as we get new information in. But just seeing the collection that we have, it paints a different history, a different life. And a lot of people leave Shorefront or leave activities that we do saying, I just did not know. 
But we want to change that around. We want to make sure that people do know and have access to the information that we have. And we continue that too with uh, not just history, but what's happening now. Uh, we develop new projects and, 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 and interests that engage the community, that bring in um, ideas and bring in dialogue. Uh, right now we work with three professional photographers that donate their time to photograph people in the community. And they bring back a print and donate to the archives for our use. And each of these people have their own stories. And interesting, we try and catch them in a, in a way that that's not what they're generally known for. Or who is this person on this motorcycle? What is his life story? And having to capture that. Who is this person behind you know, Claire's Corner? Where does she come from? What is her story? Um, just these wonderful people that make up the general community in the North Shore. And we always have presentations and programs that are open free to the public. Um, a lot of things that deal with literature, performances. Um, a new thing that we're diving into is uh, looking into doing um, blog posts, a uh, uh, podcast with uh, interviewing people in the community about their life and getting multiple generations in one room together. Uh, so we were trying to get like a high school student, um, somebody in their 20s, 30s, somebody in their 40s, 50s, and some uh, and a senior, and just ask two basic questions. Who are your influences and what legacy do you want to leave behind? And hearing, it's a loaded question, so these people will talk for about 10 minutes about their life experience and recording all of that and making that available for people to learn from and develop new products, whether it's a publication, an exhibit, or new courses of study, just so we can get this information to become common knowledge and be part of the American history that we all have and carry. So thank you. If there's questions, I see one way in the back. Yeah, I'm wondering um, if Shorefront has any exhibit that might be, um, you know, of the, the history of North Shore that might be put in a library or a suburban historical society, or do you have people who might work with us if we want to do that kind of exhibit? There's, obviously, there's a very rich history that a lot of people don't know, and if, if it were an exhibit form, a lot more people could have access to it. So the question, if you haven't heard it, if you couldn't hear it, um, do we have anything that uh, we can exhibit at different locations? And the answer is yes. Um, we have, uh, most of our exhibits travel. Um, they come in the form of panels. But we had done some tangible exhibits. Uh, the last one we did about maybe eight years ago now was at um, uh, the, the publishing company here in Glenview. Um, Pearson now. I always want to say the old one. It's <laughs> Um, but in their lobby, that these exhibit cases, so we had um, an exhibit there for about three months uh, that was uh, stationed there uh, with tangible objects, with historical re um, organizations and documents. Uh, the panels that we have, one's called North of Chicago, another one's called Legacies. Um, there's about a total of maybe 25 panels with that, really easy to hang. Right now, the Legacies panels are hanging at City Hall, and they'll be there for the remainder of this year. Um, but the North of Chicago panels, which is about maybe eight of them, right now is at Niles North High School. But that's coming back uh, mid-March. But yes, it's available. Yes? Can you talk about the Jack and Jill groups and how, how you dealt with the sense of isolation as a black child in a yeah. white environment? OK, so. Um, the question is, uh, can I talk a little bit about uh, Jack and Joe, which is a, uh, one, of the one of the dozens of organizations that exist in the North Shore. Um, <clears throat> there is the Jack and Joe North Shore chapter. There used to be a Jack and Joe Evanston chapter that was in the 1950s. Uh, the Evanston chapter expanded in the mid-1970s. The North Shore chapter started about 1976, and that was one of the first uh, teen waves, the second teen wave that went through the process. Um, at the time when my parents joined Jack and Jill, it's a women's organization uh, with families. And um, Jack and Jill as a structure helped uh, black families that live pretty much in isolation in communities 
it's a national organization, but the North Shore, we're dealing with families that live in Deerfield, Schaumburg, and they're usually the, the only family living there. And the idea of the organization is to bring these families together for activities, uh, structured activities. Um, and also, it becomes youth training. It's a chance for mothers to get together and learn about each other and, 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 and partner with each other, fathers to do the same thing, and kids get to know each other. Um, when I went through it, um, I started, I guess, when I was uh, sixth grade. That's when I first realized I was in it. Um, I when I was a teenager. Uh, we have the teen regionals where we would go to different universities and stay on campus. And we learn and are trained to be civic-minded. So the training that we do with all of the, the, the kids in, in the program is to prepare them for future um, professional careers. Um, that's it in a loose structure of it all, because it's, it's, it's very formal with the, the, the mothers of the household, but for the kids and the youth, it's like you know, a chance to get together and build lifelong friends. And the teens that I went through with um, some long time ago, um, still friends with today. And uh, we come together at a drop of a hat, especially with the North Shore chapter, we come together when, you know, times of need, we call each other and form that strong network of how we lived and survived the North Shore. Was it pretty correct? <laughs> yes? I think I'm right about this. It might be an urban myth, but do you know about the Black Cemetery on Shore Road? I do, and I used to drive by there. As a kid, I used to ride by there all the time. I can't remember where it is now. I, like, I can visually picture it, but a lot has changed since then. But um, in the North Shore, a lot of the black, uh, especially in Evanston, a lot of the early black settlers of Evanston have been buried at Rose Hill and also that, um, that cemetery on Sherman Road. Um, I think Evan Jordan Jr. is buried there. Um, uh, Madam H.M. Taylor, who I showed earlier in the film slide, I think she's buried there as well. Isabella Garnett Butler, who was the uh, founder of the Evanston Sanitarium, Evanston's first black hospital in 1914, is buried there as well. So a lot of historic figures in Evanston I talked about here are buried at that cemetery. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Like, I'm not sure the status of that cemetery either. That's something that did pop in my mind before coming here. It's like, what, what is the status of that? I did try and go on a Google map to try and locate it again, from based on my memory, but. Other questions? So with that, thank you so much for having me here today. I do hope you live here. See, I'm thinking in your mind that, wow, I did not know. But now you do. Thank you, Dino. This, this was fantastic. I'm sure you all learned a lot as I did.